Hello friends, I am going to speak about structuralism, post-structuralism and deconstruction. First of all, let us take up structuralism. There are three aspects to be considered. First of all, let us take up basic ideas which will help us to understand not only structuralism but also deconstruction. Then let us see what structuralism is and thirdly, we will find out how this can be applied to our study of uh, structuralism. Let us now take up some basic ideas. In the 1950s, there was a kind of a revolution against formalism, Russian formalism and also new criticism and it was engineered, so to say, by Zuzu. He spoke about long, parole, and science. Let's first take up the lang part of it, lang. It means the structure of the language. It is a structure that governs language and also individual utterances. That is, the language itself is there, and what I say is the utterance, and lang decides what it is. And the individual utterances are called surface phenomena also. The second one is parole. It is individual utterances. We must remember these two. Then, let us take up the perceptions of differences. You know, language as it is, the understanding of the differences between two things. Now, there is red rose. I am able to recognize red rose, differentiating it with white rose as any kind of rose. Similarly, the differences also are found in what is called binary oppositions. You know, good is the binary opposition of bad. Black, white, and so on. They are called the binary oppositions. They also help as in perceiving the differences. Another important point is about the sign. Look at this picture. This is a painting by René Magritte. And the painter, the Belgian painter, calls it, this is not a pipe. And as a matter of fact, Foucault himself has written a detailed explanation of this particular picture. Well, now what do you see here? A pipe? No. He says it is not. It is only the image of a pipe. What you hear from me when I say pipe is the combination of pa, I, pa, the three phonemes and together they form a sound image to you and you hear it as pipe. And the picture on the other hand is something different. This did not be a pipe. I may call it something else and it goes by that name. Well, now this is important for us to understand other aspects. Now, Suzu calls sign, this is a sign, no? the, the word. Signifier is a sound image, pipe. The signifier is the concept. So the sign is equal to signifier and signified. We will come back to this image of uh, the pipe later on. Let us now go to what is speech and culture. You know, primacy of speech is understood by everybody. Speech is important. Why? It helps us in experiencing human culture. As a matter of fact, speech relates us with our own experience. So, this particular aspect must be remembered. And the, it also relates to the culture. And Structural anthropologists like uh, Levi Strauss have also taken up this particular aspect of uh, structuralism. The third one is semiotics, which is called the study of science systems. We are not going to deal with it presently. Well, let us now go to what structuralism is. It is a human science that tries to understand the fundamental structures of human behavior. It is not merely the structure of a language. As a matter of fact, it started from 
the understanding of the structure of a language. You know, in the language we have the phonological system, the morphological system, and also the syntactic structures. These three structures are very important in a language. Well, now these aspects also can be seen in the fundamental structures of human behavior. Well, now this is structuralism. And again, it is a method. It is a method because it systemizes human behavior. Now let us go to its function in literature. Now please note that structuralism does not involve itself in interpretation or evaluation. Interpretation is not its business. Then, what is it? You know, what does, what does it do? It takes a large number of works of a particular genre, say a short story, to discover the underlying principles that govern this composition. For example, in a short story we have the narrative progression. There is a plot, there is a structure of the plot, then there is a conflict, the conflict is resolved and so on. And that is what is called the narrative progression. You also have characterization and, and other aspects. When we study this, taking into consideration number of works of this particular genre, then we find certain underlying principles. This is one. The second one is to describe the structure of a particular work. If I take a particular short story, say by uh, Mom, we find out the structure of that. Why? To find out how it demonstrates the underlying principles of a given structural system. We have already studied what the structural system of a particular short story is. Now we apply this to this particular work of art. Well, now having uh, uh, considered these aspects, let us take up its application to literature. Structuralist criticism deals with narrative. Now all works, all literary works can be classified under narration. All are narration. Even poems are narratives. Biography is a narrative. History is a narrative. So all written work can be taken to be narration. Similarly, even oral narrative can be taken up. Now, the structural criticism deals with this narrative. Secondly, it also deals with the language of the text. We talked about the language, you know. The structure that makes the text take its meaning. What is a structure? It is, you know, the meaning comes because of the structure of the phonemes when we speak. Or when we write not only the phonemes or the words, but also the structure of a sentence. Or a paragraph. Or the work of art. So, this text, the lung of the text, has to be taken into consideration. Then, the next also it deals with specific areas. It also deals with literary genres, how they are constructed. You know, the old way of uh, studying a piece of literature, say a novel. First of all, we talk about the plot, the construction, and then uh, the climax, and so on. How, it, uh, the, how the conflict is resolved, and whether there is a reconciliation, and so on. And there we can apply the binary um, uh, oppositions as the good succeeding evil, being successful in evil, and so on. Next, it also describes, describes how narration works. The description of how narration works is the next important point or function. The third one is not the interpretation, but the analysis of interpretation, how this interpretation is done. So these three are the major areas in the application of literature, application to literature of structuralism. Then we shall take up a very important aspect, namely the theory of myths of Northrop Fry. All of you would have heard about his uh, myth criticism or, or, or archetypal criticism. And a myth, the plural of myth is mythoi, and it consists of uh, comedy, romance, tragedy, irony, or satire. Now each aspect of love can be taken, uh, uh, human behavior can be taken under these four heads. Particularly, uh, it also is related to the, wind, the seasons, namely summer and winter. 
Well, it uh, it uh, the the particular uh, study of myths by Dr. Fry uh, is rather complicated, and it takes a long long time to explain it. The next aspect is the structure of narrative or the narratology. Now, there are three important persons to remember: Graymas, Tudorov, Gerard Janet. Now, they discuss the fundamental concept of binary oppositions. They find out the plot formula. You know, uh, what is the fundamental uh, uh, structure of a language? Of a sentence? It will be subject, verb, object. The same can be taken up in a novel or a, or a play and you will find that there is a, there will be a subject, the agent. He does something and he does it to somebody else and what is the result? This is the structure of any work, any novel or poem even. So this fun fundamental concept of binary oppositions has to be taken up as the next study of a narrative, uh, uh, narratology as they call it. Then the structure of literary interpretation, uh, this is done by Culler and I will ask you to refer to the literary theory, a short introduction by Jonathan Culler. Uh, that book gives you lots of ideas. As a matter of fact, the narratology is also explained by me in one of my Tamil essays on uh, narratology. Uh, it is Edutrai uh, Piyan. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, uh, that's a topic uh, which I have written on and it is available in Tamil uh, in Piral Yidal and also in a book. Well, so far we discussed uh, three aspects, namely the basic principles behind structuralism. Then we went on to discuss uh, the, uh, the, the major aspects of structuralism, what structuralism is. Thirdly, we applied it to literature. Let us now go to the next aspect, namely post-structuralism. The post-structuralism is rather middle position between structuralism and deconstruction. First, post-structuralism, which, which came into uh, being in 1960s, questions the assumptions of structuralism. What are the assumptions? Language is stable. Signs are, the signs or symbols are valid, fixed, stable words. So, they questioned these assumptions. They said, no, signs are not valid. They are not fixed. And the important writers that they go with this particular post-structural school, who are also found in deconstruction, are Arnold Bath, Derrida, Foucault, Deleuze, and a host of others. As a matter of fact, Arnold Bath and uh, Foucault were in the beginning structuralists, and they moved over to the uh, post-structuralist uh, deconstruction aspect. And the two books are important. Derrida's structure, sign, play in the discourse of human sciences and Bath's The Death of the Author. These two are very important for you to study. Let us now go to the next aspect and uh, uh, you will see later on or uh, presently a particular uh, um, uh, uh, cartoon in which this uh, the meaning is deferred or postponed uh, later you can uh, enjoy that. Now let us go to deconstruction. Deconstruction uh, which came to uh, the forefront in the 1960s or uh, in particular 1966 when Derrida spoke about the sign, the, the, topic, the topic that I mentioned earlier and uh, he mentioned what this deconstruction is. And you will ask me the significance of the pipe. Look at that pipe once again. Do you find that the pipe is only an image or do you get anything else from it? The, what does the pipe indicate? Does it indicate more than what you see? Is there any hidden meaning in it? Or do you have, so for example, the pipe symbolizes here for a, for a post-colonialist, the authority of the post-colonial era. Or, I, rec I recall one particular instance, many years ago, some four or five decades ago, 
we had a course in which uh, the Indian, our own Tamil uh, permanent person, uh, was giving a series of lectures on behalf of the British Council, and he was pipe smoking a pipe in the classroom in our lecture lecture lecture, lecture, lecture room. We were all surprised, and we will ask them, Dora was it done? Then some wonder has come. So the pipe symbolizes a foreigner. So so many things are indicated by that. And when we talk about uh, the, that pipe and see that, it, it has also other associations. The pipe, who made it? How was it done? The pipe and uh, the person who smokes it, the royalty and so on. It leads us to association of ideas and that is very important. Well, now, let us now go to this first question. Is language stable and reliable? It is, a, is it a reliable means of communication? You know, uh, a particular word or a sentence will mean different things for a different person. And because, not only because of the structure of the sentence, but also the word, the same words are used, but the words will be the same, the way in which it is written is the same, but in a particular context it may, it may, use, it may be different. This also applies to the emphasis that we have in intonation. I used to give this uh, example when I uh, taught uh, phonetics, intonation phonetics. Uh, let us take the example. Simple, I like tea. Suppose I say, I like tea. It means, I like it, not Lawrence. I like tea. Dr. Samadhi, who said I don't? I like it. Or, thirdly, suppose I go to Dr. Prakash's house and he offers me coffee. He said, uh, I like tea. What does it mean? I don't like coffee, I like only tea. So, a particular sentence in a different uh, uh, ways of speaking, by changing the tune, or emphasis, the meaning changes. So, a sentence will have several meanings in its uh, written form and in spoken form also it has many changes. In other words, language is slippery and ambiguous. Well, you would have uh, also learnt in your linguistics classes about ambiguity. Flying planes are dangerous. Very simple, no problem at all. But uh, suppose I say flying planes can be dangerous. Now, do they mean planes that are flying or flying the planes which is dangerous? So there is ambiguity. Now, all this is found in a sentence. So that's why we say language is not stable and reliable. So if we take this into a piece of literature, how can the meaning that is found by us in a particular text be correct? There may be something different or the same to a different reader. So that is what is called the basic principle of structuralism, uh, I mean uh, deconstruction. And uh, the structural formula, what is it? Sign, do you remember that? Sign is equal to signifier plus signifier plus signified. Well, this has to be re redefined or rewritten as sign is equal to signifier plus signified plus signified plus signified and so on till the final as many times as possible. It depends upon how many times we are able to find the signification. In other words, there is a chain of signification, chains of signification, and signifier evokes chains of signifiers. So suppose I give the word hospital, the word will lead you to different types of ideas. Up to probably up to you come to carnivorous. So the chain of ideas that are evoked by a particular word or sentence is also important. In other words, language is non-referential. It doesn't refer to a particular thing. It does not refer to things or concepts, but it is a play of signifiers, continually changing play of signifiers. Very important. It is continually changing play of signifiers. Well, let us come to an important point made by Derrida. He uses the word diffrance. He told you that 
the meaning of a word is taken with reference to its difference with another word. The particular word has no particular meaning. Only it is differentiated with another word that is meaning. So he says, language has two characteristics. Its play of signifier, signifiers continually differs. Differs means postpones the meaning. So continuously. So now it means something. After another reading it means something. Another reader it means something and so on. So what is the final meaning? It gets postponed indefinitely. And secondly, its meaning is a result of differences by which we distinguish one signifier from another. So the differences we make are important. And Derrida combines to differ in French, which means uh, uh, probably uh, to differ with differ in, in English to get the word difference. D-I-F-F-E-R-A-N-C-E. -E. Now, let us go to what the deconstructionist belief language determines our perspective of the world how we see the world is determined by language and language is ideologically and culturally specific ideological suppose i am a marxist when i read a work of uh, art when i read a text i will try to find out marxist principles or principles that are against marxism that particular work and if I, if I find that that particular work does not say anything about Marxism, then we will say that particular work is not a work of art. It's what happened in the probably Stalinistic era. And thirdly, Derrida borrowed structuralist binary oppositions and showed they are also hierarchical. Let me explain this. So we have a good, evil. We don't say evil, good good, evil. Similarly, uh, say uh, uh, something good and then you'll say something bad. Similarly, masculine, feminine. So what does it show? It shows the male chauvinistic tendency of the person or the culture. In a particular culture, uh, this will take place. The male chauvinism will find not only in the work of uh, the writings of are the texts of uh, men, but also by women. Like that is easy to understand. And uh, lastly, we must deconstruct our world and our own identity. What is our world? Where do we stand? What is superior and what is inferior? So we probably will go to who is uh, uh, the subaltern or who is the person who is suppressed. And all those things will come here. And that's our, our identity. Who are we? In what way do we see this world? And so on can be found out. And <clears throat> let us come to using literature for, this, uh, sorry, uh, using deconstruction for literature studies. Deconstructing literature. We said language is dynamic, unstable, ambiguous, having a number of possible meanings. Does it mean that we can go on interpreting a work of art, going on not interpreting, finding meanings? Secondly, existence has no center. The human existence itself has no center. It is probably moving towards the center, away from the center. So no stable meaning. And human beings have to face competing ideologies. There are ideologies that work in ourselves also. Do we stand along with the poor or are we away from the poor? When do we speak about the poor and then we don't work for them, identify ourselves with them? And in that case, there is a kind of a conflict within ourselves and there are competing ideologies. And thus, deconstruction literature has the following purposes. One, to reveal the undecidability of a text. The text cannot be decided as it is. I, the, the text itself is like that. Secondly, to reveal the complex operations of uh, ideologies. What are the ideologies that are operating in it? And thirdly, we find that 
when we do this, actually we are not really interpreting the text. We are not evaluating the text. We are find, trying to find out how, the, how these complexities work in the particular text. So, in this respect, this is different from both structuralism and also uh, uh, new criticism. And now, what do you do with the uh, text? How do you go about deconstructing it? When the, this is called the procedure, when we work on a particular text, first of all, we must note all the various interpretations that are possible. Note them down. Then, show the conflicts in them. The, the, the same ideology may be there in the writer or in the reader, but again, in the use of words, you can find out the conflict in them. And then next step is show how these conflicts lead to further interpretation. For conflicts lead to interpretation, this interpretation leads to further other conflicts and so on. And thus you argue the text's undecidability. In fact, um, lies uh, in his book, from where I have borrowed a lot for this particular speech, has taken up frost mending walls. Now everybody says that it is a, a conflict between non-conformity and conformity, tradition and modernism. And who stands for what? That is very important. You must, you must read whether the narrator is for conformism or non-conformism. And thus we must find out if from this text, the binary oppositions, how the binary oppositions also are conflicting. For example, he uses the word elves. What do the el word elves stand for? Is it the mischievous elves? The wall? The mending wall? Is it uh, the wall is to be mended? Mending the wall? Or uh, mending wall? The wall mends the conflicts between the two things. In other words, probably Frost is undecided about the importance of uh, non-conformity and conformity. Thus, today in this lecture, we have covered a lot of things from, uh, from um, structuralism, post-structuralism and deconstruction. And uh, I would suggest that for the reading, I have given uh, uh, a few things like uh, Tyson's uh, critical theory today, Similarly, for advanced study, we have the literary theory and anthology uh, edited by Ritkin, Julie, Julie Ritkin and Michael Reyns. So if you get, get these things, it will be helpful. And those who need further clarification in simple Tamil can go to my essays. Thank you very much.